robots that look like people because there's not a lot of business value in that. How are you going to make money on that? But it took a lot of different components of artificial intelligence and are embedding them in a lot of the gadgets, cars, whatever that we use today. So I'll come back to that here in a second. I wanted to mention this here, first industrial robot to work on a car assembly line. Um, and it was made by this company called Unimation. So if you look very carefully, right here, well you probably can't see it, but right here also says Unimation. This is a Stavli arm, which used to be the company called Unimation, which was one of the first com robotics companies to invent and, and craft the feel. All the robot arms out there now are based on the math principles that those people at like Unimation came up with uh, back then when it was the um, uh, 60s and 70s or so. What's funny, um, I was in the elevator bringing up all this stuff. This is not as light as it looks. So this is about maybe 60, 70 pounds, and this thing is about 90 pounds. So I was, asked, so it was pretty interesting getting the stuff over there. And I'm in the elevator coming up, guy in the elevator looks at me, and he's like, what's that, a coffee machine? And I'm like, no, it's not a coffee machine. It's a, a robot arm. He didn't understand what I was saying, but then he got it. He's like, oh, that's the, like, the thing that in factories. That's the thing that's taking away all the jobs in America. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So um, he was like kind of mad at me. And I was like, well, you know, that was the mentality about 30, 40 years ago that, well, robots are bad because they take away Uncle Joe's job, right? And so robots are bad. So a lot of political, um, in America, a lot of political um, will against using robots and, and, and automation and factors. But you know what the problem with that philosophy is? If you don't automate and become current, your business ain't going to be competitive. So then the countries that do become automated and can do, uh, and use automation, they take over and then you lose all your jobs because your company goes out of business, right? And so that's why China makes everything made in China nowadays for a couple of reasons. But one of the reasons being the automation that we were kind of resistant here in America for, for a long time. Uh, sorry, side story. So um, <laughs> anyway, you can see kind of a little timeline here. And you know, nowadays, a lot of effort is into data science, what's called deep learning, because there's so much data, right? Who in here has a cell phone? Anybody cell phone, right? How about tablet, any kind of iPad that connects to the internet or anything like that? You connect into the internet anytime, or your phone or whatever, you're generating data. All that data is being stored somewhere by somebody. So people are trying to figure out how to pull out the golden nuggets of information using what's called machine learning techniques. So I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit later. Um, the what's pretty interesting too is like where the origins of the word robot came from. So it's actually a Czech playwright who came up with the word robot, which meant like this droning machine. It wasn't actually a machine. He envisioned a chem like some kind of um, artificial being, but not necessarily mechanical, that would do kind of all the, the monotonous labor for you. Um, and so that was the guy who came up with the term robot back in the, um, in the 1920s. And then after that, this famous guy, Isaac Asimov, kind of coined the phrase robotics with these, these uh, players and movies he would do. And he's the one who came up with these three laws of robotics, you know, the robot's not allowed to harm the human, can't harm society, blah, 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 stuff like that. And I'm sure you've seen some of the movies out there um, with, with some of these you know, three or four laws of uh, robotics. But what I wanted to show you now is just a couple of videos. Please stop me at any time if you have a question. Um, I do have an accent. I've been a little bit under the weather too, so my accent is kind of compounded with being stuffy. So if you don't understand what I said, please you know, stop me real quick and I'd be happy to you know, um, slow down a little bit. I wanted to show you a couple videos and then we'll kind of talk about them as we go along. So these are a couple of real world applications of all kinds of robotic technology. I'll just watch real quick. They're all short videos and then we'll talk about them real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to tell me what the purpose of this robot is after the video.
Figured out a purpose of this machine? Somebody in back there? <laughs> that's it. It just carries stuff around. Right? So that's its purpose. Uh, you saw the one picture that's carrying like 200 pounds of stuff, even though it only weighs like 230 pounds of cell. Is this past the Turing test, this machine? No. No, right? it's not really. How do you think it's controlled? It's just something like what remote control. <laughs> it's going to kind of jump over stuff. <laughs> so, um, so this is this artificial intelligence? No. Uh, just a robot, right? It's like a remote control. You kind of move around, follow you around. Very useful, though. It serves a specific uh, purpose in the military, right? Um, next video. Next video is a little bit shorter. Um, let me show you this video. You tell me what this thing does. In there, throw this thing through the window. There's a camera on it. Literally, you control the thing. It looks like an Xbox Plus uh, 360 control, and you can see what it sees. So you can kind of do uh, reconnaissance. These robots are very expensive, right? So when you throw it in the window, if the bad guy is behind there, the bad guy can destroy the robot. That will probably cost out of fifty thousand dollars. But you can buy a new robot, build a new robot. You can't build a new person, right? So, so that's why these things are important. The one that I didn't find here, of course, the big use, military use of robotics is um, what's one of the biggest, does anybody think of another way that military uses a type of robot? Ron. Ron. The drone robots, right, the predator drones, which is, of course, very different from them, but these are very interesting, right? So they're in Pakistan or wherever, they, they, they take them off from on, you know, there's people on the ground that um, make the drones take off and land. But once they're in the air, I think there's people in Arizona who are flying the missions, which are all top secret. So you don't want people in Pakistan flying the drones on their mission. You just want them to get them to take off and land them, which is the hard part. And then once they're up there, it's remote control from the other side of the world. It's pretty crazy. Okay. Check out this guy, completely different type of robot. You tell me what it does. What's its purpose? Cleaning the floor? No. That's it. Medical um, a tablet, you know, pill delivery device. So this was when I was at USC Upstate in Spartanburg. This is one of the machines at Spartanburg Regional Healthcare System. They have three of them. And they have logged in one year, those three machines walked, you know, ran right around 5,000 miles within the building. And normally a human would have to do just running medicine back and forth from floor five to floor one or whatever. So in the pharmacy, the pharmacist puts um, the medicine inside the machine, closes it up, 
And then when it gets where it's going, the nurse can put in a code, it opens up, and then it can get the medicine back out of it. When it gets close to the elevator, it can call the elevator itself and um, um, go up and down the elevator and whatnot. My wife used to work at the hospital, and the machine's not found, it makes mistakes. So one time, my wife was in her office, and they had this commotion going on outside, and the robot was going down the hallway, yeah. You saw it now, okay, right? So here it comes. Do, 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 do. And then somebody left a, a chair in the hallway. So the robot has a little voice sensor on it too, except some automated messages it says. So it's standing in front of the chair saying, please move. Please move. Please move. And it was like you know, the funniest thing to see. But eventually it figured out that this, this wasn't moving and then it navigated. Um, yeah, it was again, serves a very specific purpose. Somebody tell me what this is. See if you can figure it out. What's going on here? Space station? No. That's a new one. Underwater? Underwater. Mm -hmm. It's a drill. Mm -hmm. It's not such a this case. Taking samples from the ocean floor. It's a good, good guess. So it is an underwater robot? In this particular case, I think it's installing a pump or something at the bottom of the ocean. And I'm pretty sure, um, in the field of underwater robotics, OSHA, a company called Oceaneering is the biggest company there is, right? And they were in Louisiana, close where I used to work. So we would go visit them. You can see the R, the machine. So we're looking at this as like a little submarine. And this is the camera looking out from the submarine. And here's one robot arm. And here's, there's usually another robot arm right here. And then they use these robot arms to manipulate, you know, whatever it is they're trying to do. So in the Katrina, uh, not Katrina, when uh, BP had that big oil spill, remember, remember that? Um, yeah. Years ago now, it was robots that they had to send down. They had to plug it all up and make it all right because you can't swim down there. It's thousands of feet down. Um, so you can see it kind of manipulating a part here in PS. Ocean Air is an awesome business model. Each one of these robots. They sell them to the oil companies or the shipping companies for like $3.5 million a piece. And you can't pilot them yourself. You have to contract them to actually pilot the submarines for you. So it's, it's an awesome business model for making a lot of money. Um, very difficult. So these are tethered robots. So in other words, there's a cable. There's a boat up here on top of the water. There's a cable that comes down to the robot. You know, think about it, it's rough up here, the boat's moving around, there's current inside of here, and it's trying to do pretty sophisticated work. Very difficult to pilot those machines. Underwater robots. How about this one? How about this one? So this is the big thing you heard a lot about a few years ago. Amazon's deliver all our packages. Technology's almost there now. When the big announcement came out that Amazon was going to start delivering packages a few years ago, people were like, yeah, right. I was like, yeah, right. You have no way you can control a drone to do that. But the technology's come so far now, you're going to see when you fly this around, it's totally possible. What slowed a lot of them down, a lot of people down, is all the laws and regulations, right? What if this crashes on you? So now the laws are getting there, it's almost all in place, and you got to fly it under 40 feet, you got to fly it at least 30 feet over people. All these kind of rules have now been finalized. If it crashes on somebody, who sues who? All these, all these guys. 
kind of things got to be um, worked up. Okay, last, I think this is the last video, the next one. We're off to pressing. Oh, I knew this would be My name is Erica. May I ask your name? My name is Nick. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Nick. Let's learn a little about each other. To start off, where are you from? I'm from Canada. Wow, Canada's quite far away. It's pretty cool there, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Japan, much like many other advanced androids and robots. There are so many great applications for these robots. Whether it's helping the elderly, guiding tourists, or even for entertainment, it's all very exciting. Oh, sorry about that. I got a little carried away. So, Nick, what do you do for a living? I'm a student. It's not very interesting what they actually say, but I wanted to show that one. So, the Japanese as a country, Japan, is investing tons of money still on making humanoid, you know, human looking robots. And there's a bunch of videos you can find out there. They're making little robotic kids. That, I mean, some of the stuff just looks creepy because you can tell it's not, it's not human. You don't know what, what's going on there. Um, but that, uh, that one there probably comes the closest to passing the Turing test, right? Of everything we've seen. But did it really? You can tell just like that. It wasn't a real person. Right? So, um, yes, those are some, um, some of the technologies that we're at right now. And you know, artificial intelligence so as a whole, it's gone from, and this is really only a few countries investing money in trying to create a Terminator. But people are investing a lot of money in trying to do natural language processing stuff. Google hires a ton of people to try and make the next search engine where you just type in the question, it searches the internet for you, and just gives you the answer, not a million hits. Uh, neuroscience, study of the brain, computer vision, sight, uh, effective computing, how you model emotions in a robot, very interesting. And of course, the robotics itself. So before we switch over to play with toys, I got one slide on each of these. So if you guys, you know, study robotics or, you know, in college, you take artificial intelligence, these are the first topics you're going to be learning about. And one thing, the first thing you'll learn when you take like a neuroscience class is how all the little brain cells work. So you know what's very interesting about our brain cells? The way they're similar to a computer? A computer only speaks in one language called machine language or binary language, which is a sequence of zeros and ones. One zero, one zero, one zero. On a basic, underneath your, underneath your um, iPhone or whatever, that's what's happening, zeros and ones. But the cool thing about the way our neurons and our brain work is the same principle. Either a neuron is communicating with another neuron, or it's not. It's either on or it's off. So you see the same basic principles inside of this computer here. Are human brains faster than computers in terms of computing power? Uh, is my brain faster than this thing in terms of its computing power? Any ideas? Yes. It's a trick question, so the actual answer is no. So this is actually faster than my brain in the sense of how fast it can move a zero or a one from one place to the next. My brain, all our brains are governed, the way um, information travels in your brain is with little electrical currents that go along these wires from one neuron to the next. And we're limited by our human physiology. It's only so fast that electricity can travel along these little wires in our brains. And it travels at about 400 megahertz. So in your computer at home, how, how fast is the CPU? Maybe like 1.5 gigahertz, 3.5 gigahertz now in modern computers. So modern computers overtook the human brain several years ago on pure computing speed. Um, can you connect the computer directly to the human brain? Yes. Yeah. And how do you do that? You stick a wire in your head and connect it all in there. That's one way to do it. And there's lots of research going on doing that. But there's non-invasive ways of doing it too. So because your brain is sending electrical signals all around each other, in your physics class, you're going to learn when electricity goes down a wire, it creates a magnetic field around it. 
So there's videos you can look up where uh, there's these devices that look like football helmets. They put, you put down your head, and they can measure the magnetic waves coming off your brain. You don't have to stick anything inside your head, and they can tell the basic thoughts that you're thinking. It's pretty creepy. Um, do, 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 do. You know, when somebody, you all seen the videos, right? Somebody has a bad accident, they lose both their limbs, all of a sudden they're eating with their feet and they're driving with their toes and, and things like that. You seen those videos before? That's what makes the human brain such an interesting computer. Once those parts of the brain that used to control your arm is not being used anymore, it repurposes itself to control your toes, which gives you more dexterity in your toes. Then. It's a very interesting computer that we don't quite understand yet. Natural language um, understanding, that's what I did in, in graduate school, is very interesting. The first thing you start out with is how you figure out what the words in the sentence, the parts of speech are. So let's see how, let's see if you've been paying attention in your English class. So time flies like an arrow, right? Very simple sentence. What part of speech is time? Is it a verb? Is it a noun? Noun here. Noun. It's a noun, right? Very good. How about flies? Very good. How about light as a hard one? Uh, conjunction. Not conjunction, that's good guess. Not, not an adverb, that's good guess. Preposition. Preposition, that's right, it's a preposition, like an arrow. Like it's a preposition in this case. How about an? Article. Article, and then arrow is another noun, another noun right? Uh, very easy if you did it, right? First thing you gotta do when you study this stuff is write a computer program that does what we just did very easily. But the problem is that it's a very difficult problem to solve. So let me show you another sentence real quick. Fruit flies like a banana. All right. So very similar sentence. Fruit is a what? Noun. Noun. Flies is a? Verb. Could be either. It could be either. It could be either. But probably, if we're talking about fruit flies as a type of fly, and they like bananas because bananas are fruit, probably we could guess it's a, a noun in this case. But it's definitely a verb before, right? How about like? Definitely a verb now. It was a preposition before. How about a? Article and then a noun. So you see, very simple five word sentence. And it's very hard for us to even agree upon as much as get a computer program to do it. So that's one of the first things you do when you study this stuff later on in college. And then the next thing you have to do is then figure out the meanings of the words. So after you've figured out these amounts of verbs, what do it actually mean? So take the, the verb to tear. Right? If you look this up in the tool called WordNet, which has every English noun and verb related to each other, It'll give you numerous, it'll give you 42 different meanings of the word to take. Can somebody think of a meaning used take in a sentence, somebody? Verb. Like, uh, like, say it in a sentence. I take a banana. I take a banana, meaning like I, you? Pick it up. I took a banana off the shelf. Yeah. Good, somebody else. I take a picture. I took a picture. Very different than physically. How about something else? I took a bus. I took the bus somewhere. Any of you guys took any tests this last year? Right, taking a test, um, taking your medicine, there's tons of different meanings, 42 different meanings of the word to take alone. All right, so, and um, just with the speech recognition is very difficult too. So once a young person tell me, what, let's go to the beach. Which two should be recognized, if you write a program to recognize? The first one, everybody agree? Yes. yes. And what's the part of speech in this case for this one? Preposition. Preposition again, there you go. All right, so in, um, in computer vision, the main thing you're doing is getting input pixels from the image and then try and make sense of the world. Couple questions, why do humans, dogs and cats and everybody else have two eyes? Depth perception. Depth perception. Depth perception, right? And you can do a little experiment here. It kind of works. But if you just hold out your thumb in front of you like this, and then close one of your eyes and try and grab your thumb. You can still do it, but if you, it's a little bit more difficult than just doing it with what your eyes open. The reason you can still do it is because you know a lot of information about how big your thumb is and things like that. But if this is a perfectly dark room and I hung something in front of you, you don't really know what this little dot space. You close one eye, you don't know if it's five feet away from you or five inches away from you. You need to have two eyes that then um, projects, you know, where that object is in space. Anybody heard of the robot car Stanley? That was the first car that 
completed this desert track autonomously back in 2003 or so. So it was one of the first uh, uh, vehicles developed by Carnegie Mellon that could navigate a desert on its own from the start line to the finish line. You know, that's a big current application of AI and robotics, right? Trying to get self-driving cars. You know which company is investing a lot of money in that? Uber. Uber. You know why? The worst part about Uber's business model are the people. <laughs> so they're trying to eliminate the drivers altogether. It's pretty funny. Um, and yeah, there's tons of computer vision in car style this already. So let me show you this. If you ever do this stuff in the future, especially you young people, you know, you're gonna get images. What you do is get images. Each one of those images is just a combination of what's called pixels, no tiny dots. Does any everybody heard of the word pixel before? All right. What does the word pixel mean? Where does it come from? <laughs> and what is the word, where does that word come from? It's a contraction of two different words, picture element. P-I-X element. There's where the word pixel comes from. So all these little pixels each have a little value. Now look at it very carefully. You see I kind of cut out a little corner of her eye, the little corner of her eye there. And look at this number here, 62. That's low because that corner of her eye there was darker than this part of her face, which was lighter. So this is what you're working with when you do computer vision stuff. It's huge arrays of numbers where dark means, um, smaller values mean dark, um, higher values means light. And then you gotta write programs based on this to figure out where somebody's eyes is in the picture or whatever. Very complicated, very complicated stuff. So that's, that's it and we'll start playing here in a second. Um, oops. So do you think, I want to pose just a question for the audience, I mean, do you think we'll ever really get, you know, a Terminator or some yes. machine like that that passes the Turing test? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's only a matter of time, right? And of course, the biggest advancement in, in this field will come when we figure out the map of the brain. And we can recreate a human brain um, uh, artificially, then, you know, whatever. So anyway, very interesting. All right, so let's switch over to see if I can get my voice. Okay. So, it's right here. Okay. Super funny. Okay, so, <clears throat> we're going to try to play with the drone first. The other one takes me a little bit longer to get in the door. So this is a, anybody know what kind of drone this is? The maker? It's a, D, a DJI. The model is the Phantom 4. And he, um, it's a very popular drone maker. Very easy to fly. I'm a, I am a terrible pilot. I need like to fly. I'm going to try and fly in a second. Um, any guesses how much this costs? <laughs> more than 900. About a thousand. A little bit more. So 1299. Actually, I think that's exactly it. So if you get the Amazon right now, you can get one that's 1299. It comes with um, the drone, a couple batteries, the carrying case, that's that silver thing over there, the controller, but not the iPad. Okay, so you got to have the tablet yourself, and that's what runs the application. So over the last couple of years, um, it's amazing how far the technology has come on these devices. So many different things. For example, let me put it back here for a second. The way you connect the propellers on this drone, the simple um, locking mechanism like that. So it's a little spring-loaded device. You don't have to like wrench them on or anything. You literally just push it in place like that and it's attached, that's it. And if you didn't attach it good, you go to start it, it go flying off. <laughs> Not that that's ever happened to you, but you know. <laughs> um, these two propellers, if you could see, if you're up here, and you can take a look at this later uh, when I'm done talking. These have a silver band on them, these two do, and these two have a black band on them. The silver band here matches those silver dots here, you got the silver, the silver, black, black. The reason for that is that these, look at that is. To balance it out. To, to, to balance it out, right? is that what you're gonna say? To kind of, because if they all spun in one direction, what would happen? It would be going up, it just be going up. It wouldn't necessarily be going up, but um, it would start just spinning around itself. Everybody knows how a normal, how a regular helicopter has one big propeller on it, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it? No, I don't know. There's another little propeller here, right? What's that little guy do? It, it, it serves a couple purposes, but the main thing it does is as this is flat, um, spinning around this way, the frictions in the air and everything would cause the body of the machine to go in the opposite directions. So you need this little tail propeller to keep it stabilized. Same principle right here. So that's why when the, like, in the movies and the 
top of his tail to get like blown up. Yeah. You start spinning, out. absolutely, that's yeah. right. See, television is very educational. <laughs> <laughs> Thank is, you. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> This is the battery, and it goes in. So the battery alone costs you uh, $135 for this battery. It's an expensive battery. And of course, battery technology is the limiting factor to any mobile robot, right? As soon as the physics people figure out to make a smaller, cheaper, lighter battery, then this field advances as well. So you get the battery, you snap it in just like this. How much is the battery well? It's the heaviest thing on it, I'm not sure to be honest with you, but I got a few extras up here afterwards, you're, you're welcome to come play around with it. And so you can buy extra blades, right? Correct, absolutely. Um, it comes with a camera here already on a gimbal. You only have the ability, I'll show you in a minute, to move the camera in one direction, up and down like this, that's it. So how can you look at something over there? Just turn the whole drill, right? But you, you can see that you have to have the ability to move the camera like this, because the one thing you can't do is move the drill like this. Because <laughs> if you move the drill like this, what's going to happen? It's going to go straight down. So you have to have that one ability to move it um, back and forth. Notice these bars here. Why do you think we have these bars connecting the feet? Um, for, 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 um, for take off and land without bumping the camera. It definitely helps protect the camera a little bit, you sir. The same thing, yeah, yeah. Any other things? Like sliding when it gives a little more grip, absolutely. Does it? Yeah. Um, it helps it land. It helps it land, absolutely. And one of the coolest things that you can also use it for is this. What do you need to land a plane or a helicopter? You need a flat, stable surface, you know, a, run, a, a runway or a launching pad, right? What if you don't have that? Anybody watched Shark Week recently? One of the shows that was on there was these guys on the little board um, looking at tiger sharks, and they were using the drones to look at tiger sharks. But what is out there bouncing around like this, there is no landing surface. So you can take it off and land it just like this. So you just grab it, take it off, and land it just like that. So that's another purpose that these guys, um, that, uh, um, <clears throat> that those little bars serve. Okay, so let me try and get it started here in a minute. Okay, so this is the controller. Just somewhere that that was sitting on. The cap. Well, it's um. So when we put some, when we turn it on, it'll kind of hold it in place. It's hanging off of a gimbal here, which helps it with its balancing, so it doesn't act, it doesn't flutter around too much. All these different types of robots have different ways to boot them up. So when I got this machine in the mail, I read the manual and it said, oh, the way to turn it on is that you got to press and then press and hold the battery for it to turn it on. Why do you think that is? Why not just press and turn it on? Safety, so you don't butt down your drill. You know, don't press by accident and it just like turns on by accident. So in this case, what is that? Press, 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 press. Okay. So it's now it's kind of warming up and booting up. Four bars means full power. How long, somebody guess, do you think I can fly it around Dino. on a full battery? Uh, Less? 30 minutes. About 28 minutes is what it says. Yes. Wow. I've never flown really it that hard. No, 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 no. Okay. So likewise with the controller here, the way you boot the controller is press, press. And oh, I only got 40% charge on this. Um, so you see the iPad just kind of turned on as well. So I want you to be able to see this. Let me see if I can switch real quick. So you can see what. Now we can one second. Okay, so I'm just going to take the iPad off real quick. So just going to let off this iPad. Alright, so the way to get this going, you know, if you did a cycle and you have your iPad, you enter your top secret password. <laughs> yeah, that's the app right there, so you just download it. 
disconnected, which is not good. So why is it disconnected? Um, I'm sure this demo ever. <laughs> Is that 28 minutes of flying or 28 minutes total? Fly time. Fly time. So we should be dreaming of it there right now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's better. So as you can see, it's already connected to the camera. So, you know. Yay. Yeah. Right, it's a little bit delayed. And as you can see, and so after I'm done playing with it, I'm gonna switch to the big machine here. And then after I'm done playing with that, then you know you can leave, or if anybody wants to come to try and fly, we'll do that kind of at the way end. So you get the chance to play with it later. It like yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Oh, I hope it's not, I hope it doesn't mess me up. If you look at the camera real quick, there's a little lever here that moves the camera up and down. So if you can see it down there in the front, then you can't in the back. But the camera's already moving back up and back and forth. So I'm gonna try and take it off here and fly around in a second, unless it gives me this, it gives me this problem, and I don't know does it. Uh, well, I'll try in a minute, but I just wanna say, these things are super easy to fly, they practically fly themselves, but they do make mistakes. And typically, when it malfunctions, it happens on takeoff, okay? Because there's a lot of sensors in this machine that try and keep it steady in the air. And typically, if something's malfunctioning, it's happening at the very beginning. I'm telling you all this because when I go take it off, and you see it lists to the side, that's typically what happens if it malfunctions. It lists along one of its dimensions, and I've had it list along all three dimensions. I turn it on, I may have to take off, and all of a sudden, it starts to do this. <laughs> it just like spun off, crashed, my $135 battery came popping up as a disaster. Um, so, I have crashed this before doing <laughs> demonstrations just like this one. And I've done these kind of demonstrations a hundred times. But one time it did crash and it landed on the back of somebody and he didn't sue us, so that was great. So, uh, but it, it just prepared you. Some bad could happen. If, uh, let me just see if I can take it off at several automated pieces of software already in it. One of the coolest ones is a vision software. If we were outside and it was up there, and say it could see you here in this field, I could click on you and say follow, and it'll autonomously follow you around by looking to see where you're at. Very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> the compass is used a lot for, you can tell to go north, go south, things like that. There's a built-in GPS where you can program it to visit GPS points and do all these kind of things. So let me just turn this one off real quick. This was the one I was more nervous about. I crash it in here. This is the one I'm nervous about. I won't get it to run. Yes, sir. What's that one? Say again. Yeah. This here? No. This? Mm -hmm. This is related to this. Oh. So let me get it. Let me get it going. Hopefully it's going to work. So let me just turn this off. See if it's on. 
So again, this one is probably not as exciting as the drill one because it's not going to fly around over your head. Um, but still, that drill one twelve hundred bucks. A lot of money, twelve hundred bucks. This thing was thirty thousand dollars. So that's too much. Try and turn it on. No, it's like very bad. That's good sign. Good I gotta press something in real quick. I'll start talking about it in a minute. slams on the brakes inside of the arm, makes it stop as soon as possible. The way these work, just so you know, it's kind of interesting. Any emergency stop button in the uh, in industry, you press it, it makes it, it will engage the emergency stop, and then you have to twist it to release. You twist and it pops back out. That's the way it is on any of these types of machines. Right here in the back, you can't see it. This little lever here, when I go to move it around, I have to press it in halfway. But not all the way, there's two stops to it. You press it halfway and kind of hold it there, and I can keep pressing it even further. But to get it to move, you only press it halfway. This is called the dead man switch. Any ideas why it's called a dead man switch? Drop over the other one. I'm going to have to walk in. Stop. Exactly. So, so in other words, you hold it at a halfway point, because us humans, when we're alive, we're capable of doing that. But if we were to die in the factory floor, these machines are very dangerous. Very dangerous. They can be very dangerous. So out of one of two things going to happen, we're going to release it, and that's going to make the arm stop. Or sometimes if you get electrocuted, I think that's what he said, if you get electrocuted, what happens to your body? It tenses up. It makes you squeeze it really hard. So that's why the dead man switch has a middle point where you have to hold it up. So it's kind of interesting. People, of course, how many people figure that out years and years ago by observation? Yeah. Somebody, somebody holds that all the time. On the no, there's ways to, um, definitely when it's running on its own, you don't have to hold it. This is mainly like when you're building the application. And there's even a way that I don't have to hold it. But, but typically when you're building your application and you're not, you know, um, it's not a finished application, you can hold it there to see. Okay, so this is the teach pendant. 
This here is what's called a controller. The controller is like the computer, the brains of the machine. So the, the controller is computing all the numbers and everything. You can hook up all kinds of stuff to this, and then it's telling the arm basically what to do. You see there's another e-stop button right here that you can kind of stop it with that button. Uh, so, you see this is very similar to one of our own arms. It has several joints. So you see this is a moving joint right here, a moving joint right here, right here. How many joints do you think it has? Close. Three. Six. It's actually, this one has six. Why six? There's a very specific reason. Not only does this have six joints, but you see how this is made of the arms in the industry? But look kind of like this for mathematical reasons. And it's too complicated to go to right now. Do you know why you need six? You need six joints to get to any point. To get to any point in space, you need three joints. So if I wanted to pull on your finger real quick, just press on this. If I wanted to make a robot arm to get to that point, I need three joints to be able to go X, Y, Z to get there. But I need three more points on joints that approach her finger in any possible direction. The arms are in the So three to get you there, three to work it around any direction. That's why you need six. The six is the magic number. So let's see if I can actually so these things can be very dangerous because of how fast they can go. So I will only keep this today in what's called jog mode, so it goes very slow. And even in jog mode, I have it right now 10% speed, which means very, very slow. Uh, because, like I said, they can move so fast that it would topple straight off the cable because it's not going to that So that's what my little control pad looks like. I think that's probably the best thing I'm going to get. Hold on one second. So this is my little computer screen on the teach pendant. And you can program the entire application right here from this teach panel. But typically, the programs you work on are very complicated. So usually, you program on a computer. The computer is connected to the controller with Ethernet, and then you upload the program this way. But what I'm going to try and do right now is just to show you how you can manually move around, and then I'm going to try and write a very simple application real quick, and, and, and then that's it. So let's. First, see how we can get it to just turn it on. Later on, when you want to come up here and try and play with this yourself, I'll show you this hunt. You won't be able to see what I'm doing right now. But I hold down on the, um, the several different modes. I'm going to call jog mode. Jogging the robot around means manually putting it in positions using the teach pendant. So I'm going to press my dead man switch halfway. I'm going to press the green button. And now, power has been enabled to the arm. So now the arm has power, it's ready to go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this in what's called joint mode. So I'm going to move each joint separately. Well, so let me, I'm going to turn up the speed a little bit, otherwise it goes a little too slow. So you see that's moving. Joint number one, I rotate it around that way. That's joint two. Later on, when you go up here, you're going to see you can move it in the positive direction or the negative direction. Which way is positive, which way is negative? Positive up, negative. Yeah, so that, don't think about up and down. Think about clockwise or counterclockwise. So the joints are rotating in a clockwise or counterclockwise way. Which way is positive? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Yes, clockwise. Clockwise. <laughs> so this is a math principle. This is not true to be here in the library. You're going to get this in math class at some point. If the axis is looking at you, counterclockwise is a positive rotation, clockwise is a negative rotation. You're going to, you're going to need oh, another yeah. thing to teach you here real quick. It's what's called the right hand rule. It's a way to get your coordinate system. Everybody ready? Stick out your finger. Point at me. That's your x direction. Um, 
extend your middle finger like that. That's your uh, Y direction, and your Z pops up. That's called the right hand rule. This is a representation of a coordinate system in three dimensions. And you can't see it, but virtually there's one right here, and there's one right here. And when I'm moving this around, the controller is calculating how to move one coordinate system with respect to the other mathematically. That's what the machine is doing for us. Right hand rule, remember that. So let me turn it back on. All right. Oops. Now, you see how I moved it down a little bit? This is why I want to move it slow. The machine can definitely hit itself, hit its surroundings, and damage itself. So you got to be careful not to hurt yourself and hurt the machine at the same time. Everybody know what this? What, what is? Where's my hand on the machine? It's the great part. That little part there. So notice there's no like hand on the machine, right? So there's a couple different um, end, what's called end effectors that you get on the end of robots. This is um, one of them. So this is a little two finger gripper. It's a pneumatic gripper, so you use compressed air to squeeze the fingers closed or open them back up. So just like that. So, um, so that, that's made by something called shunt. Feel free to pass it around while they get back. Um, well, I just don't have it hooked up right now. The other way that I wanted to show you real quick, that is typically the way you pick stuff up in factories. You know what main thing these, th these things do in factories? Pick up something from here and put it over here. That's kind of what it's doing. Let me show you this device here. Like, probably got a volunteer. Who wants to volunteer to help me demonstrate this? Anybody? So, perfect. All right. And yeah, just come up here real quick. You're going to be my robot arm because I don't have this hooked up. And I need a little tiny scrap of paper. Does anyone have a little tiny bit of this robot? mechanism is called a Bernoulli pump. A mechanical engineer a long time ago figured out how to design a contraption. There's no electronics in this. Inside of this little black box, there's little flappers and stuff. And when I blow air or when you apply compressed air inside this way, some escapes this way and it creates a suction effect this way. So this is called a suction cup gripper. And this is the more common way in industry to move stuff around. You don't use fingers, you use suction cups. So go ahead and try and pick up a piece of paper, just like kind of put it on a piece of paper. This one right here. Don't find one right here. So you see I'm not I'm not blowing in it right now. Pick it up. So you see you can't pick up a little piece of paper, you probably can't see from back there. But trust me, it's not coming up. So now when I blow air into it, he's gonna do it again. <laughs> And ta-da, so you can see it works. So, um, so in industry, typically what you do, you connect this here, and then the, com the air comes out of here, and it's hooked into a compressor, and I can apply more pressure in my lungs, and they can pick up huge items using that basic technique. All right, so the number one thing these machines do in industry, to wrap it up, is material handling. Pick up something from here, put it there. And the way you program these things in the industry, literally, you're teaching at certain points and then making it go back and forth to those points. So to wrap up here, I'm going to teach you three points, the right program to simply have it move around these three points. And basically, that's 70 80% of what happens in the industry. Don't they use them to paint and things like that too? They do painting, welding, and some assembly. But the, the number one thing they do is um, material handling. Pick up from here, put it down. Alright, so. First thing I gotta do is create a new application.
what should we call it? On fun two. But I think fun one's already happened yesterday, I did fun one. So I'm now moving around to whatever spot I want. Try and make a point. So I'm going to save this location in memory. I'm going to give it the point A. That's it. And So that just saved that point. What do you think those numbers mean there? Those are the angles that each joint has been rotated right now to get to that current configuration. So as I move around to a different location, so I'm going to move around. I'm going to stay at this point now. One more point, and then I'll write the program. ABC. So I've remembered those three locations and then they call them A, B, and C. So now, I go, go back. And the way these programs work, there's two programs, a start program and a stop program. We're gonna write the start program. And so let's try and do this together. So this is, this is what's called coding, right? We're actually gonna write the code right now to make the machine do something. So it's gonna take a couple minutes. And I'm gonna insert, a new line of VAL3 code, that's the name of the programming language. And I'm going to create a while loop. A while loop is a typical programming uh, construct, any programming language has it. And I'm just going to always do something over and over again. So while true, true is always true. So I'm going to insert that. And then I'm going to insert a movement command, so in VAL3, if I wanted to move to a point, the command is called move J. So the insert a move J. A move J command. Which point do I want to move to first, A, B, or C? A. That makes sense. My tool has got to be this thing called flange. The flange is what's called the end of the machine is called. Um, don't worry what that means. Enter hold down on this run button for it to actually run because again it's all about safety. So I'm gonna hold down on it. Right up the speed a little bit. So, which point is it moving to first? A. A. So after it goes to A, B. And that, that's all it's going to do. Repeat that over and over and over again. Again, we were to crank this up to full speed and operational mode, and okay, this would just swing off the table. We should have so much momentum. And, Basically it. The only difference is, like in a real application, is that typically if it comes here, it says squeeze your gripper to fix something up. Put it over here, release your gripper. That's what I'm thinking about. Ta da!
<laughs> and so if you would like to um, have a turn to come up here and move around the arm maybe or something like that, you go up and do so. If you're finished with your survey, could you please leave it in the back? And thank you for attending. <laughs> I remember what my question was. I think when we sat down, we thought, oh no, this might not be where we should be. You know, but it was wonderful. We did a great job.